I, the concept is pretty simple. Um, it's about our obsession with buying things new and then discarding them and buying new and buying new, our consumerism. And we can talk about that, but first, Abby called me when I asked, what do you want from an artist talk? She said, well, tell the people about yourself as though nobody in the audience knows you. So, here we go. <laughs> I've been a painter for 30 years. My medium started with watercolor, and then I went to acrylic, and then I was introduced to encaustic, and I was gobsmacked. Mm -hmm. It hit me, um, this was my medium. I went home from the workshop and ordered $1,000 worth of materials <laughs> and never stopped playing with it. Turned my greenhouse into a studio, worked at it, and then um, over time started teaching. For those of you who weren't here last night, um, Marissa and Shannon and Audrey gave a wonderful talk, which you'll be able to see online um, at the Kreuzer website. And Shannon talked about what encaustic is. It's basically beeswax and damar resin, which is a tree sap. That's what gives the paint um, its hard quality. It allows me to buff it and make it shine, which most of my work, that's the way I like to present it. Uh, when I work with it, I melt it uh, on a palette to almost 200 degrees, so it's liquid. I apply it with a brush, and then I connect it to the previous layer with a heat source. So my students use a heat gun because it's safe. But for me, I play with fire. I have, <laughs> I have an assortment of butane and propane torches, and I can use my, I think of my torch really almost like another paintbrush. I can just kiss the surface lightly with the flame and retain the texture that wax likes to do on its own. And, or I can give it more and make it melt and move um, when it dries, which happens fast. I can carve back in and, and reveal layers underneath. In fact, when you look at the paintings, particularly um, the, the Shape of Things series, you'll see um, nuances and layers where I've scraped and revealed under colors. And you can't paint, you can't put that kind of shapes and coloration that comes from, I use a, a clay scraper. So I put it on, I take it off, I put it on, I take it off. <laughs> I couldn't even tell you how many layers because there's so much of that, that action going on. So it's my medium, I love it. Um, I've become known as um, something of an expert with it since I've worked with it for over 20 years. I've taught students for 15 years um, before COVID. The last nine were here in town at Lima School of Art. And it's so rewarding to share my passion and my love with, with students. Um, but after uh, some time goes by, when 2018 came around, my father passed from brain cancer. And um, when big things happen like that, it's a time to stop and evaluate what's going on in your life and in your work. And I started to feel like I wasn't so happy with my paintings just being another decoration on a living room wall. Um, you know, you think, goodness, does the world need another painting? There's so many artists out there trying to sell their work. I, I was doing well with a number of commercial galleries. You know, I, I kept them supplied, but I started asking questions. Um, about the work itself and maybe even getting a little bored with what I was doing because I mastered, there's so many techniques you can do with encaustic, but I've done them all. And so I started wondering what else can I do with wax? And about that time, there was um, an opportunity to apply for a, an artist grant through a nonprofit organization, International Encaustic Artists. And my proposal was for an exhibition that involved getting off the surface, using fiber, using material, plus my wax to create form, to go sculptural. And I, I, I received the award, and that allowed me financially to spend the next year working towards that exhibition 
Um, but I didn't know how to do what I said that I was going to do. <laughs> so I'm a self-taught artist, and I spent that year um, teaching myself things. I took a lot of workshops. I went to St. Louis to the Surface Design Association conference where I met a lot of um, experienced contemporary fiber artists, and I started to, you know, creep into their world and see what people were doing. I went to dozens of exhibitions of fine art based on textiles. Um, I went up to Anderson Ranch and took some fabrication, fabric fabrication. Um, I even messed with kinetics. I was thinking I want to make my sculptures move. I learned that uh, I don't like motors, and so what we see here, like the Flight of the Innocents, they can move there on on things that can turn, but they rely on nature, on the breeze or the wind that might be around. Um, so I, I self-educated, and the result was um, the exhibition titled I Never Played With Dolls in November of 2019 at the Bridge Gallery. And it, everything, it was off the wall, on the floor, and I was exhilarated. Um, I, I came away from that exhibit. I think the exhibit was barely down when I was approaching Abby and asking, when can I get into your gallery? I, I want to do this again. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had four takeaways. Um, that exhibit was my baby step into art activism. It was the first time that I started putting my own values into what the work was talking about or what it was conceptualizing. Um, and it ran the gamut. It was from gender equality to climate change to um, abortion rights or population gun control. It, 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 it encompassed a lot. And the way it worked was it was gentle. It wasn't um, preachy or didactic. I tried to gently encourage conversation and questions about the subjects, not telling anybody or judging what they should or shouldn't. And so what I came to feel is that I could have my art as my gentle activism. In my 60s, I didn't need to go out and walk in the streets and be in riots and protests anymore. I could, I could use my art that way. So that was my first takeaway. I knew that my next exhibit wanted to continue this gentle activism through my art. I also wanted to have part of the show have collaboration. Um, in the doll show, I worked with an actor, and she was a living doll wandering the gallery during, during the opening night. And I had the opportunity here on opening night to work with Aaron Graves, a local designer. He came to my studio, saw the work I was doing, he riffed off of that. I gave him a bunch of my castaway clothing and he deconstructed and reconstructed the point being of course that to encourage people to consider rather than getting rid of their clothing what can they do to remake it and give it more life and keep it out of the landfill so we did that um, another element that i would, wanted to include was um, i wanted people to be able to touch and feel interactive mm -hmm. so this pile here is for touching um, you can pick them up they've got heft People are surprised when they pick them up and how they feel. So these are the keepers, and they're for you to um, play with. And finally, I wanted to continue using stitching and fiber in my work. And so I had two years um, after Abby said, yes, you can have this show, this gallery. Um, about a month or so later, COVID happened. So I have had lots of time to work on this show. And I also had lots of materials. I frequent um, the local resale craft store who gives a scrap. Do you all know who gives a scrap? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in fact, um, a percentage of the sales of this exhibition, exhibition go to scrap to support their um, children's program. Program. But anyway, in fact, the um, series here above you, Flight of the Innocents, these are all vintage baby dresses that came from Surap, so I had them on hand. Mm -hmm. So again, um, I, spent, I spent the two years working on this exhibition, 
but I also spent time doing more research and more learning. I did a lot of um, studying of the history of textiles, and I came to an understanding that this interest I had in working with the threads and stitching by hand has a long history of, um, of a way of honoring the feminine. And I came full circle to my own history in that my mother and my grandmother were hand stitchers. In fact, um, a couple of these dresses have stitches that I looked at my grandmother's hand uh, crazy quilt and the top stitching that goes on and I, I worked to replicate the, those stitches. But um, what I'm trying to explain is in my early career, I steered away from anything that was women's work. Um, it didn't, it wasn't because of our patriarchal society that, that doesn't consider um, hand stitching and domestic chores as fine art. I, I, I didn't want to identify with that. And so now, when I look back, I understand that as my mother would sit there stitching in the evening, it was her form of meditation. And over these, this almost two years of COVID, I was doing the same thing with the hand stitching and all these threads that you see hanging, every single one of those was hand waxed. It was a matter of laying the wax on the palette and brushing it and then flipping it over my wrist and then separating the thread from the other bundle and putting the next one. So there was, there was a lot of that meditation going on. Um, and also in my history, I really, really got about women primarily using textiles as a form of protest, which of course worked right into my interest in using my art as a form of activism. Um, you have the suffragettes who had their textile banners, they were trying to get the vote. You know, we can speak words and they come out, but then the words are gone. And they might be heard once and then they're gone. These, these visual banners are here and you see them and you see them and you see them. And then as recently as the Met Gala, when OAC was wearing that white designer dress and she had the red tax the wrist, rich written across the dress. Um, so I'm, I'm embracing the textile portion of my, of my work as um, embracing my feminine self. Um, there's that. And one more interesting point about the research, because I really delved into the history way back. Um, pockets have always been of interest to me, you know? Women have to look for um, clothing with pockets. I made this dress so I could have big pockets. <laughs> and back by the window, there's um, six pieces in the sculpture series, The Pocket Keeps. That series started actually um, with me thinking, again, I, I came into working for the show not knowing what the show is going to be, maybe until a year into making the work. And with the pocket keeps, I was thinking about the secrets we hold. I was thinking about the castle keeps, the last um, reserve away from the invaders. And I, in fact, I had mentioned to Abby that might be what my show's about. And so I started making these structures with the little pockets to hide things. But then as they evolved and they started speaking to me, I understood that they were more than just about an individual secrets. They were about this whole history of women who have been secreted away from the history books, that their contributions to our culture and our advancements as species just go unknown. So I had a lot of fun looking up, looking for women, looking for women, and, and soliciting from friends names of women until I narrowed it down to the six. And so there's little stories about each pocket key, um, which you can read on the labels on the wall, or you can take your time and go to the croisergallery.com website, where Abby has so kindly and lots of time and energy put the little story from each um, piece of work. This show, um, there's four sculpture series, there's three separate painting series, so there's over 90 pieces of work here. And I'm so grateful to the curatorial 
job that Abby did to make this look as beautiful as it does. And so now we've come to the present. And as I mentioned, there's so many stories here. Um, I can't, I don't want to bore you and start trying to tell you. I would like to invite you to ask me questions about if there's any pieces in particular or about the process. One more thing I do want to say, particularly to the artists in the group, is this is my second lesson, and so hopefully it sticks with me this time, of understanding that starting um, a show with, with, a, with a theme, starting theme kills, you, you need to let the work speak to you. You need to make the work and live with the work and let it grow and give yourself time. I mean, this two years I've had has, was the biggest blessing. Um, and then, and then, in fact, about a year into it was when I woke. I was a writer before I was a visual artist, so words and stories are important to me. But I woke with the title of the show, The Clothes We Wear, and then that led me to Google. What is this, The Clothes We Wear? Is this taken? Is this something somebody's doing with? And then to start riffing in my mind with what I was doing, how I was deconstructing, and, and then researching fast fashion and being horrified at all the inequities that result stair-stepping down. So, anyway.